In an obscure museum in Eastern Europe, a fossil hunter has made a startling discovery. While randomly sifting through a set of drawers, he found a collection that hadn't been examined for 30 years. I was going through these drawers, finding drawer after drawer of very much the sort of fossil that I would expect to find, really nothing of any particular excitement. And then pulling open one drawer, I spotted in the middle, sitting in a little cardboard tray like so, a fossil, the likes of which have never been found anywhere in the world. The paleontologist, Per Alberg, had found a new piece of evidence in a 400 million year old detective story. How and why creatures first left the water to live on land. For a long time, all life was in water, in the seas, in the ocean. And it's not until about 370 million years ago that we start to find the first animals venturing out on land. Fins evolved into limbs at some point in that time period. For over a century, scientists have searched the world for fossils that can help them unravel the mystery. Now a series of new discoveries is shaking up long-held views on how evolution fashioned this profound transformation. How it happened that fish left the water for land and became the ancestors of us all. central Pennsylvania, near the Appalachian towns of Heiner and Renovo, stretches an ancient sandstone formation known as Red Hill. It was here that paleontologists Neil Shubin and Ted Deschler discovered extraordinary new clues in one of evolution's most enduring mysteries, how ancient creatures left the water to walk on land. The reason why I'm in this business is because of, of a sense of discovery. I mean, that's really what I like to do. Being a paleontologist is great because if you look at rocks of the right age, of the right type, you know, and if you're really lucky, sometimes you can find a fossil which will fill one of these big gaps in evolution, one of these big transformations. It's a detective story, and you're finding evidence out there. We're, we're breaking rocks, and we're, we're looking for little pieces of evidence to help piece together this the story of how limbs developed from fins. The story began to take shape back in the 18th century with a simple but crucial observation. A vast array of animals showed striking similarities. They all had four limbs. They are tetrapods. We are tetrapods to wit one, two, three, four. Horses are tetrapods, evidently enough. So are dogs. So are lions, tigers, and bears. So is a bird, two hind legs, two wings at the front, which are modified front legs. A snake is a tetrapod. It has no legs anymore, but it's quite clear that they're derived from a lizard ancestry which had both forelimbs and hind limbs. Non-tetrapods have a wide variety of body plans. Mm -hmm. 
Some have hundreds of legs. Some have none. But all tetrapods beneath the skin share similar features. They all have backbones with special interlocking spurs. It's as true of us as it was of the dinosaurs. All tetrapods have a pelvis attached to the backbone to support their weight. They all have a rib cage to protect the heart and lungs. And they all breathe air through nostrils. Their limbs invariably consist of a single bone nearest the body, the humerus, then a pair of bones, the radius and ulna, leading to feet or hands, which never seem to have more than five fingers or toes. It's true of dinosaurs, human beings, and even whales, for under their flippers, whales have five fingers. If mammals, reptiles, birds and amphibians all have this common structure. What does that mean? That means they all must have descended from an ancestor that already had this structure. Our question is, what did that ancestor look like? Where did it come from? Sometime during the four billion year history of life on Earth, there were primitive tetrapods from which all four limbed air breathing creatures descended amphibians and reptiles, birds and mammals. And even further back in time, there were water-dwelling creatures, fish, that were the ancestors of those first tetrapods. The fish likely belonged to a group known as lobe fins. Like this modern-day lungfish, the ancient lobe fins had lungs as well as gills and the unique structure in their fins that looked like a precursor to arms and legs. There are two types of bony fish on the Earth today, ray fin fish and lobe fin fish. Now, ray fin fish are very common, as represented by this common soul here, this, this creature's dinner. And in fact, most of what we have for dinner are, are the ray fin fish. The reason why we call them ray fin fish is because their fins are composed of a very special sort of bone. You can see them here. These are the rods. These are the rays that make up most of the surface area of the fin. The type of bone that makes up these rays is not present in our limbs. Now, this monster here, for better or for worse, is one of the fish that's most closely related to us. It's a lobe fin fish, and the reason why we call it a lobe fin fish is because its fin is composed mostly of this thing here, which you can see is this fleshy lobe. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, this lobe is, is very important because many of the bones that make up our limbs actually first evolved within this lobe. Lobe fin fishes were common during a time in Earth's history called the Devonian period, 150 million years before the age of dinosaurs began. Tetrapod fossils were plentiful in rock layers younger than the Devonian, but older rock layers yielded no tetrapods at all, only more primitive creatures, like sponges, worms, and some fish. So the water-to-land transition must have occurred during the Devonian period, between about 410 and 360 million years ago. Imagine for a moment that you were able to go back to the world just before the beginning of the move onto land. Let's say you go back to the world of 500 million years ago and you stand on the shore. What do you find? Well, let's say it's low tide, so you walk down onto the tidal flat. You find it's really not that different from today. There are rock pools and maybe anemones and stuff growing in them. There are seaweeds draped over the rocks. There are little arthropod things, crustacean-like creatures and so on scuttling around. The overall picture, the system is there, and it's not so different from today. But turn your back on the sea and walk in land, and what do you find? A barren, empty wasteland. No greenery, no trees, no insects. Wind keening over the rocks. 
a barren land that could not possibly support you. Then, in a time frame between about 450 and 350 million years ago, group after group of organisms start making their way onto land, assembling the immensely complex land ecosystem which we inhabit today. In 1881, on the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, a crucial discovery was made by a Canadian farmer. He stumbled upon the most perfect fossil of lobe fin fishes ever seen in rock from the Devonian period. Called Eustonopteron, the layout of its fin bone showed a striking resemblance to the bone structure of tetrapod limbs, and with a clarity never before seen. Here in these fossils, the limb was just laid out simply beautifully, and it was so easy to turn it in your mind into a tetrapod limb. The, these bones, the one and the two bones, they were, they were laid out, and there were these bits in the, 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 the ankle and the, the wrist and so on. Absolutely fantastic, beautiful material. Clinched it, really. What they thought they'd clinched was the sort of fish from which we all came, an ancestor with fins that were verging on limbs. But could they find creatures that look more like tetrapods, animals with the beginnings of true arms and legs? Despite years of searching, fossil hunters had never found tetrapods in Devonian rock layers. Perhaps there were none. Or perhaps none had ever become fossilized. The chances of any animal becoming a fossil are extraordinarily remote. And the only way that we have a lot of fossils is that there's been an incredible amount of time and an unbelievable number of animals. The animal originally had some hard part that was preserved, even though the soft parts were dissolved away by bacterial action. Then it got buried in a place where bacterial action stopped, uh, usually in mud or something like that. And then it has to be covered up pretty soon with some kind of a sediment of sandstone silt or maybe volcanic ash. And then it will gradually get further and further into the earth. And then the next thing is, because a fossil is something that's dug up, it has to be come near the surface and somebody has to find it. In 1931, fossil hunters got lucky. A team of Swedish scientists on a geological expedition to Greenland came upon a 360 million year old Devonian creature that definitely was not a fish. It had the telltale bone structure of a tetrapod. It appeared to be a milestone along the evolutionary path from living in water to living on land. They named it Ichthyostega, meaning fish plate, since the roof of its skull was still fish-like. People have been looking for this, in a way, ever since Darwin, ever since 1859. This transition is the one that so intrigued everybody, going from the water to the land and no evidence of it, and then, boom, they found it. Terribly, terribly exciting. Really very, very important. It fell to Eric Jarvik to analyze this crucial new discovery. He spent years digging hundreds of fossilized bones out of the rock to try to reconstruct the anatomy of the creature. Jarvik was a brilliant anatomist, incredibly painstaking. He began working on Ichthyostega in 1948, but didn't complete the work until two years before his death in 1998. And during Jarvik's nearly 50 years of research, no one else was able to study the fossil. If a particular research group has collected material and is actively engaged in studying that material, 
then other people don't muscle in and take it away. It was extremely frustrating to everybody that they were holding this to their chest, as it were, and only letting out little bits of information while everybody else is going crazy, trying to write and work in a field in which you know somebody else has a lot of information and you don't know what it is. Jarvik did release two papers during the course of his research comparing ichthyostega to the fish Eustenopteron. He was convinced that ichthyostega had been a true tetrapod, with a rib cage, a pelvis attached to a backbone with interlocking spurs, and four limbs with five digits each that would have enabled the creature to walk on land. Ichthyostega was then the most primitive tetrapod ever found. Still, there must have been several intermediate creatures between it and a fish like Eustenopteron. No one was ever really satisfied with Eustenopteron as the immediate ancestor of something like Ichthyostega. Um, so I think people have not only been looking for things that are a little less fish-like than Eustenopteron, they've also been think, looking for things that are a little more fish-like from Ichthyostega, so wanting to close the gap from both sides. Somewhere in the rocks, there may be other fossils of four-legged creatures from the Devonian period that would help fill in the evolutionary sequence from water to land. There may be more what are often called missing links. Charles Darwin called them transitional forms in his 1859 masterwork on evolution. One striking transitional fossil was found in 1861, the Archaeopteryx, a reptile with feathers. It was widely hailed as proof that birds had dinosaur ancestors but few such clearly transitional forms have been discovered. Presumably, the transitional forms were very rapidly outcompeted by their, more, by their own more advanced descendants. So these transitional episodes in the history of life tend to be brief and involve, it seems, relatively low numbers of species and probably low numbers of individuals. <laughs> Some transitions occur when there are dramatic environmental changes. Creatures not well suited to the new environment die out. But just by chance, some members of a population will be able to survive. Those with thicker fur if a climate turns colder. Those with longer bills if a major food source develops deeper flowers. Most of evolution is stability in the production of new species that are pretty like the ones that came before. We have 500,000 species of beetles, just for starters. But every once in a while, you do have a transition to a very different kind of environment, or you do have the invention evolutionarily of a very different kind of organ or structure that allows the occupation of a part of the ecological world that wasn't inhabited before, and that catches our attention. So there was a point when you didn't have organisms on land. So what was it about the evolution of creatures that lived in the sea that allowed them to get onto land? The most popular explanation for why fish evolved to walk on land was proposed by Harvard paleontologist Alfred Sherwood Romer. Romer based his hypothesis, known as the drying pond scenario, on a view long held by geologists, that the red color of Devonian rock meant it had been a time of severe drought. The drying pond scenario basically ran like this. There were lobefin fishes living in the rivers and lakes of the Devonian continent. Um, but because of the seasonal droughts that were supposed to be happening during the dry season, a lot of these pools would be drying out. And fishes stuck in a drying pond would be faced with the choice either of just sitting it out glumly in the mud and hoping for rain, or else boldly setting out 
overland in search of another and perhaps more permanent water body. The idea was that lobe fin fishes became gradually better and better at using their lobe fins to drag themselves across the mud. Romer suggested that limbs evolved as fish adapted to making this desperate march across land. These would have become the first tetrapods, our ancestors. Throughout the early 20th century, a mere handful of fossils shaped our view of Devonian creatures. Then, quite remarkably, from the waters off South Africa's east coast, the Devonian period suddenly came alive. <laughs> Just before Christmas 1938, Marjorie Courtney Latimer, the curator of a small museum in East London, South Africa, was called down to the docks to examine a most unusual catch. 22nd of December 1938 was a wonderful day. I came onto this most beautiful fish. It was just on, just on five foot. It was silver and gold and green and blue and had white kind of flecks on it and to my horror it had these slim like fins and i thought to myself what on earth can this be i've never seen a fish like this somehow i was going to preserve it somehow whatever happened i had to save it that was the in intuition that i had it, 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 it must be saved by all, all, at all costs. Unable to have the fish frozen, she left it with a taxidermist until Dr. J.L.B. Smith, a prominent South African scientist, could come identify it. He stood at the head of the table and he said, well, lass, he said, this fish will be on the lips of every scientist in the world. It's a silicant. Coelacanths are a group of lobe-finned fishes that lived during the Devonian period and were thought to have gone extinct over 76 million years ago. It was absolutely fantastic because it was, it's living, and it, it's exactly like having found a live dinosaur or a live Archaeopteryx. And it was all those things like The Lost World by Arthur Conan Doyle and whatnot come true. It's absolutely amazing. Meet Professor Smith of Grahamstown, South Africa, with a model of that famous fish, the coelacanth. Coelacanths are close relatives of the fish that scientists consider was the ancestor of all land animals. The coelacanths have lived for probably 350 million years, and in that time they have changed but little. As you see, the fins are more like paddles than ordinary fins. Smith was convinced the coelacanth could actually move about on the ocean floor using its lobed fins. I have no doubt that this fish crawls about on the bottom quite easily. Yes, the professor says the fish is a kind of ancestor of man. Poor fish. It was found in December, so that means it was uh, the middle of the summer. Huge fish, five feet or so, no way to preserve it. So it was preserved in a taxidermist mount, a skin mount, with the bones of the head and the skin. And everything else was thrown away, which of course was a tragedy because all sorts of information went with it. With little left to study, Smith was determined to find another coelacanth alive and offered a reward to local fishermen. It took 13 years, but finally, a coelacanth was found off the Comoros Islands near Madagascar. It didn't walk on the bottom, 
but it was later seen that its fins moved in an alternating left-right pattern, just like tetrapods do when walking. After studying the complete creature, Smith realized that coelacanth had less in common with tetrapods than he had thought. Most of its organs were distinctly fish-like. Coelacanths must have survived virtually unchanged since branching off from an ancestral fish some 360 million years ago. But Eustonopteron, also a fish with limb-like fins, was on a different evolutionary branch, one that produced four-legged creatures like Ichthyostega. The next question was, what animals filled the 20 million year gap between Eustonopteron, the fish, and Ichthyostega, the tetrapod? The answer came in 1981 from a motorcycle enthusiast who was also Pierre Alberg's advisor at Cambridge University Museum. I would be sitting there working in the morning if I'd got in early and suddenly hear this bum, 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 bum sound like in the courtyard, which was the associate curator of vertebrates arriving for her daily work at the museum. I was always somebody who was interested in natural history, really from as far back as I can remember. And in England, we have little I spy books where you tick off what you've seen. And I used to have a whole collection of those and a whole collection of the little observers books. And um, we used to go on holiday specifically so that I could either look at the local fall flora and fauna or look for fossils. Jenny Clack had long dreamed of solving the mystery of how and why creatures first walked on land but it seemed a remote possibility. I had just finished my thesis when I started work here and was looking around for another project. And a colleague of mine said, don't worry, something will turn up. And I didn't believe him. What turned up was the notebook of a geology student who had visited Greenland years earlier. In one corner, he'd made an extraordinary note. He'd found remains of Ichthyostega, the creature Eric Jarvik had discovered. He'd noted Ichthyostega bones and skull bones common, and early tetrapod specimens are not common anywhere, particularly not Devonian tetrapods on a mountain in Greenland. Even when they've been collected in the 30s, they weren't common. They were chance finds after days of walking the scree. And to see this in his notebook just set the bells ringing. We have to go there. It took six years to raise the funds for the expedition, but finally Jenny Clack headed off Accompanying her was her PhD student, Per Alberg. We were very excited to be going at last. But this is, of course, also coupled with a certain trepidation. This is a big undertaking. It was an expensive expedition involving air support, helicopter time, all sorts of things. It's at least 100 miles from the nearest permanent habitation, and that's an airstrip, which is only manned during summer. And of course, it was possible that we were going to find almost nothing, or at least nothing new. So the potential was there on the one hand for a spectacular success, and on the other hand for a considerable embarrassment. The landscape is vast. You have no sense of scale because there are no trees. And so something will look as though it'll take you half an hour to reach. It actually takes you several hours. Even with maps and detailed notes, Alberg and Clack feared they'd never find the right spot. The notes in the book say 825 meters. And in fact, that was wrong. We'd been starting too high up the mountain 
And eventually we thought, well, first of all, we thought, are we on the right mountain? And then we checked, and yes, it was the right mountain. So we decided that we would start from lower down. When they explored the mountain at a lower elevation, Plack saw something. It was covered with dirt and soil. It very nearly got thrown on the scrap heap. Um, but fortunately, we brushed some of the dirt off and we could see part of a skull. They had found the most complete tetrapod specimens since Eric Jarvik's expedition 56 years earlier. Fossils of a four-legged Devonian creature called Acanthostega. Clack returned to Cambridge with dozens of fossils. At last, someone other than Jarvik would be able to do original work. But the true importance of the trip did not emerge until Acanthostega had undergone several years of painstaking preparations. Clack recalls it was her colleague, Mike Coates, who first saw a hand emerge from the rock. The first thing he found on this block was a finger, this digit here. So we've got a number of finger bones aligned along the edge of this block. Then he continued with the preparation. He found the next finger, which is here, with its end curled over. And then a third, similarly with this crooked finger end, and a fourth, again, with that. And then there's a gap. And then he went on to find another finger. Individual finger bones are really quite clear. And that makes a total of five. But he still had all this area here to prepare, so instead of stopping, he went on to clean up the rest of this area. And lo and behold, here is another digit, so that makes six. And he expected to finish there. And then, to his amazement, here's a seventh, and finally, an eighth. What? <laughs> My initial thought before I had seen the specimen was that there might be a problem here if the specimen is preserved in such a way that the two forelimbs are lying on top of each other, it's easy to see how you could produce something that would look like a hand with more than five digits. And I wondered whether something like that was going on, whether there was, in fact, an interpretation problem. But, of course, once I'd seen the specimen, it was perfectly plain that that was not so, that you did indeed have a forelimb with a humerus, radius, ulna, and eight little fingers in a row. Acanthostega had eight fingers on one hand, suddenly calling into question one of the most basic assumptions behind the previous hundred years of research. Until that day, I had assumed, like everyone else, that five was the primitive number of digits for a tetrapod limb. The old explanations for the origin of this structure, after all, one of the most fundamental and defining structures of being a tetrapod, and in our own way of being human, was in the bin. Alberg and Clack now believe our earliest ancestors with legs must have had numerous digits, and then somehow evolution reduced them to five over the eons. And upon further examination, Acanthostega called another fundamental assumption into question. Its limbs were not made for walking. If you look at the limbs, what you find is that the joints are all orientated, angled, so that the limb would have stretched out just to the sides. You know, on the end of the humerus, the radius and ulna just fit in um, grooves along the end of the bone, not as they would in a um, later animal underneath there, so it's not supporting weight like this. 
there's just no way they could have brought its leg underneath to take any weight. Similarly, with the hind limb, which we found a bit later on, similar kind of arrangement, no ankle to speak of, just a paddle-like limb. Acanthostega's legs would have been useless for walking. And what's more, it could never have lived out of the water for long. It breathed primarily with gills, like a fish. The evolution of legs was apparently not triggered by the need to walk on land. So the thing that has really changed is that rather than the fish going onto the land while they've still, still got fins, we've turned that completely on its head. So now we've got tetrapods in the water, still in the water, while they've got limbs with digits. Stunned by these revelations, Clack checked her findings against a fragment of ichthyostega, which she'd found in Greenland. Her team prepared the specimen and counted the toes. Seven. Why didn't Jarvik see this? There was more that Jarvik had not seen. Clack found that Ichthyostega's legs were also not made for walking. They, too, were more like paddles. Ichthyostega lived around the same time as Acanthostega, 360 million years ago. And while they both had limbs and gills, Acanthostega was a bit more fish-like, especially in the structure of its tail. These differences show how evolution was experimenting, tinkering with different body plans that would eventually result in all modern four-limbed animals. But what drove these changes? It had been widely accepted that fish evolved legs to move between bodies of water during times of drought, the drying pond scenario. But now that explanation no longer fit the facts. The next piece of the puzzle was unearthed in the United States. During the Devonian period, North America was part of a huge landmass called Laurasia, made up of present-day Europe, Asia, and Greenland. Lying near the equator, Laurasia had great tropical sandstone formations, which became home to fossils of myriad life forms. And when the continents drifted to their present positions over the next 400 million years, these fossils were scattered across the globe. Here in Pennsylvania, a wide stretch of Devonian sandstone runs through the hills. Most of the range is forested, the ancient sandstone layers buried. But there are places where the Devonian layer was exposed when the hills were blasted away to build new highways. Paleontologist Ted Deschler began combing this area known as Red Hill while a graduate student of Neil Shubin. No one had found tetrapod fossils here despite years of searching and Deschler was hoping for a change of luck in a newly excavated road cut. Well, sometimes you'll open up a rock and it really changes the whole way that you may be thinking about a certain problem, about something in evolution that, that you've learned, but you might change what the next student will learn. In fact, science works by building on the ideas of others. In 1995, Deschler opened up a Red Hill rock and discovered a nearly perfect bone. It was the first piece of a Devonian tetrapod ever found on the North American continent. We named it Hynerpeton, which means crawling animal from Heiner, and actually the, uh, the town down below, below us here is, is Heiner, Pennsylvania. And 
The first part of the body that we found, actually the original material and, and all we had to work with for, for a while, was its shoulder girdle. And a shoulder girdle actually is a very interesting part to find if you're looking at some of the earliest limbed animals because it shows you where that limb attached into the body. And we could tell from the shoulder girdle of Hynerpeton that it was an animal with very muscular limbs. It's not like the shoulder girdle of a fish at all. More able to carry its own weight than either Acanthostega or Ichthyostega, Hynerpeton could possibly have walked on land. Deschler and his colleagues had noticed something else. Among the swaths of red sandstone were patches of green material. Okay, majority of the rock out here at Red Hill, of course, is red. Climbing up through sandstones, siltier sandstones and mudstones. But right into this zone up here, we start with a green layer. It's reduced, um, probably because of all of the plant material that's buried within the rock here. Finding these fossilized plants prompted the Red Hill team to rethink some old ideas. Perhaps the late Devonian environment wasn't as drought-ridden as experts had thought for nearly a century. Perhaps it was more like a rainforest. The most common thing we're finding is a tree-like plant. It actually has a long, tall trunk. And some people say these got up to 30 meters tall. So these were truly the first canopy sort of producing plants. We also find fern-like plants and a variety of other things. And so we're really seeing a diversity uh, from a site like Red Hill. These stream systems that were running across big, wide floodplains 370 million years ago would have created big, muddy channels. And in between those channels, there would have been forests. In fact, they were some of the first forests on Earth. Plants had finally taken hold of land environments. And that's a very important change when you think about it. The Earth was brown and muddy for the billions of years previous to this point in time. And it was during the late Devonian, really, that the land got green, and especially in wet areas like these deltas that were shedding off and running into a seaway out in Ohio. So what was happening on land was new, and what was happening with the animals in the freshwater environments was also new. The earth may once have been barren, but the findings in Pennsylvania suggest that by the end of the Devonian, the earth was densely forested and etched with rivers. These were bordered by something completely new, swamp. The first four-limbed creatures may have evolved in this wholly new ecosystem, just the kind of environmental shift that can trigger major evolutionary change. For the very first time in Earth history, animals and plants are living on land in a significant permanent way. And a lot of open niches in that waiting to be exploited. Some of these new niches were the margins of this watery world. In the tangle of vegetation, creatures with limbs and fingers would have a real advantage over those with fins. I think we have to think of these fins or, or limbs or flims as something that would be used by the animal for moving through more complex environments, like swamps, or uh, environments that, where there may have been trees down in channels, or just shallow water to pursue prey, or to escape the guy who's trying to prey upon you. And there was definitely something to escape from. The Red Hill team found evidence of a predator of terrifying proportions. A fish Keith Thompson had named Hyneria. Hyneria is the most common lobe fin fish at this site. It's also the biggest. 
It's probably two or three meters long. This, this is a single tooth from a large Hynerius, and these were carnivorous, obviously. And with a few predators like that around swimming in the, in the channels of an estuary of a mudflat delta system, you could see why some of the lobe fin fishes might find it very um, judicious to hop out into the, growth, into the undergrowth and find somewhere else to live. <laughs> The revised picture of the Devonian environment opened up new ways of thinking about the forces that drove the evolution from fish to tetrapods. Limbs seemed to have evolved not after a fish ventured onto land, but before. They were useful to navigate through swamps, to avoid predators, or perhaps to lay eggs on shore out of harm's way. Limbs and fingers evolved because they gave the creatures who had them a distinct advantage in the swampy Devonian world. Using them to walk on dry land was a happy accident. What the tetrapod story shows us is that evolution is not goal-directed. It wasn't trying to evolve limbs. What is evolution in this case? It's just tinkering. What we're seeing is in these streams 370 million years ago, a bunch of different types of fish tinkering with new ways of making a living, living in that new environment. It just so happened one of those tinkered solutions was extremely successful. It led to all later life that was, was to live on land. More of nature's tinkering would be revealed when Per Alberg, now of London's Natural History Museum, visited Eastern Europe. He began rummaging around in a forgotten drawer of an obscure fossil collection at a museum in Latvia, and a piece of bone caught his eye. It turned out to be a jaw fragment from a Devonian creature that showed both fish and tetrapod characteristics. I picked this piece up, had a look at it, turned it round, and really I knew within about half a minute that here was something absolutely extraordinary. Alberg named the creature Livoniana after the region in Latvia where it was found. And to confirm his suspicions that it really was a transitional fossil, he ran it through something called a cladistic analysis. It's a database that lists all the anatomical features that distinguish fish from tetrapods. Some are obvious. Does the specimen have limbs or fins? Lungs, gills, or both? Others reflect minute shifts in the position of blood vessels or bones. Such fine detail allows scientists to identify a creature from just a fossil fragment and place it on an evolutionary tree relative to other animals. As an example of the kinds of distinctions cladistic analysis can make, Alberg has placed the lobe fin fish jaw on one side, the Livoniana jaw in the middle, and the tetrapod jaw on the other side. The differences are subtle but significant. What you can see, if we look at the end points, is that these two jaws differ in quite a lot of ways. First of all, if we look at this pit in the fish's jaw, which is a particularly important feature, a deep hollow that goes all the way through to underlying bones. The bone you're getting in the bottom there is a different one to the ones that are coming up on the surface here. In Livoniana, that's the same place. The pit has almost disappeared, surrounding now a blood vessel hole here, which we didn't have in the other jaw. If we look at the tetrapod, we have the pit now gone altogether. And here's that lower blood vessel hole there in the tetrapod. So in this respect, Livoniana kind of agrees with the tetrapod. On the other hand, we find that in the fish, a bone from the outer surface of the jaw comes around down to here and, and ends, and it's it abuts against another bone up here called the prearticular. In the tetrapod, 
the bone from the outer face comes all the way up here. It forms a big tongue extending backwards so, and it comes all the way up here beneath it. So quite a different arrangement. Livoniana here has got the junction and the bone exposed on the surface, just like the fish. So in this case, Livoniana agrees with the fish. So as you can see, depending on which characteristic you look at, it either lies sort of halfway between, or it agrees with the tetrapod, or it agrees with the fish. Exactly what you would expect from an intermediate form. The analysis shows Livoniana to be clearly a transitional creature. It fits on an evolutionary tree about midway between fish and tetrapods. And it has one very odd feature. There are seven rows of teeth. That makes it unlike any other creature we know of and suggests that it may have been one of a host of evolutionary experiments, most of which met with extinction, but one of which was the ancestor of us all. In recent years, Darwin's 400 million year old detective story has become much less shrouded in mystery. In the Devonian world of forest and rivers bordered by swamp, a whole new way of life was born. The distinction between being in the water and out of it became blurred. From this swampy place, our ancestor came crawling onto dry land. It was one of the most momentous events in all of evolution. For one day, that creature's descendants would inherit the earth. In north-central Pennsylvania, near the Appalachian towns of Heiner and Renovo, stretches an ancient sandstone formation known as Red Hill. It was here that paleontologists Neil Shubin and Ted Deschler discovered extraordinary new clues in one of evolution's most enduring mysteries, how ancient creatures left the water to walk on land. The reason why I'm in this business is because of, of a sense of discovery. I mean, that's really what I like to do. Being a paleontologist is great because if you look at rocks of the right age, of the right type, you know, and if you're really lucky, sometimes you can find a fossil which will fill one of these big gaps in evolution, one of these big transformations. And it's a detective story, and you're finding evidence out there. We're, we're breaking rocks, and we're, we're looking for little pieces of evidence to help piece together this, this story of how limbs developed from fins. The story began to take shape back in the 18th century with a simple but crucial observation. 
a vast array of animals showed striking similarities. They all had four limbs. They are tep leading to feet or hands, which never seem to have more than five fingers or toes. It's true of dinosaurs, human beings, and even whales, for under their flippers, whales have five fingers. If mammals, reptiles, birds, and amphibians all have this common structure, what does that mean? That means they all must have descended from an ancestor that already had this structure. Our question is, what did that ancestor look like? Where did it come from? Sometime during the four billion year history of life on Earth, there were primitive tetrapods from which all four-limbed air-breathing creatures descended, amphibians and reptiles, birds and mammals. And even further back in time, there were water-dwelling creatures, fish, that were the ancestors of those first tetrapods. The fish likely belonged to a group known as lobe fins. Like this modern-day lungfish, the ancient lobe fins had lungs as well as gills. And the unique structure in their fins that looked like a precursor to arms and legs. There are two types of bony fish on the earth today, ray fin fish and lobe fin fish. Now, ray fin fish are very common, as represented by this common sole here, this, this creature's dinner. And in fact, most of what we have for dinner are, are the ray fin fish. The reason why we call them ray fin fish is because their fins are composed of a very special sort of bone. You can see them here. These are the rods. These are the rays that make up most of the surface area of the fin. The type of bone that makes up these rays is not present in our limbs. Now, this monster here, for better or for worse, is one of the fish that's most closely related to us. It's a lobe fin fish, and the reason why we call it a lobe fin fish is because its fin is composed mostly of this thing here, which you can see is this fleshy lobe. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, this lobe is, is very important because many of the bones that make up our limbs actually first evolved within this lobe. Lobe fin fishes were common during a time in Earth's history called the Devonian period, 150 million years before the age of dinosaurs began. Tetrapod fossils were plentiful in rock layers younger than the Devonian, but older rock layers yielded no tetrapods at all, only more primitive creatures like sponges, worms, and some fish. So the water to land transition must have occurred during the Devonian period, between about 410 and 360 million years ago. Imagine for a moment that you were able to go back to the world just before the beginning of the move onto land. Let's say you go back to the world of 500 million years ago and you stand on the shore, what do you find? Well, let's say it's low tide, so you walk down onto the tidal flat. You find it's really not that different from today. There are rock pools with maybe anemones and stuff growing in them. There are seaweeds draped over the rocks. There are little arthropod things, crustacean-like creatures and so on scuttling around. The overall picture, the system is there and it's not so different from today. But turn your back on the sea and walk in land, and what do you find? A barren, empty wasteland. No greenery, no trees, no insects. Wind keening over the rocks. Tetrapods. We are tetrapods, to wit, one, two, three, four. Horses are tetrapods, evidently enough. So are dogs. So are lions, tigers, and bears. So is a bird, two hind legs, two wings at the front, which are modified front legs. A snake is a tetrapod. It has no legs anymore, but it's quite clear that they're derived from a lizard ancestry which had both forelimbs and hind limbs. 
Non-tetrapods have a wide variety of body plans. Some have hundreds of legs. Some have none. But all tetrapods beneath the skin share similar features. They all have backbones with special interlocking spurs. It's as true of us as it was of the dinosaurs. All tetrapods have a pelvis attached to the backbone to support their weight. They all have a rib cage to protect the heart and lungs. And they all breathe air through nostrils. Their limbs invariably consist of a single bone nearest the body, the humerus, then a pair of bones, the radius and ulna, In an obscure museum in Eastern Europe, a fossil hunter has made a startling discovery. While randomly sifting through a set of drawers, he found a collection that hadn't been examined for 30 years. I was going through these drawers, finding drawer after drawer of very much the sort of fossil that would expect to find really nothing of any particular excitement. And then pulling open one drawer, I spotted in the middle, sitting in a little cardboard tray like so, a fossil, the likes of which have never been found anywhere in the world. The paleontologist, Per Alberg, had found a new piece of evidence in a 400 million year old detective story. How and why creatures first left the water to live on land. For a long time, all life was in water, in the seas, in the ocean. And it's not until about 370 million years ago that we start to find the first animals venturing out on land. Fins evolved into limbs at some point in that time period. For over a century, scientists have searched the world for fossils that can help them unravel the mystery. Now a series of new discoveries is shaking up long-held views on how evolution fashioned this profound transformation. How it happened that fish left the water for land and became the ancestors of us all. <laughs>